That was a quantum effect. It was an ultraviolet light source, very much like in the electroscope experiment. Lots of energy shone down onto the jacket. Molecules in the jacket, well, just emitted light. It got excited up to the higher level, emitted light in the visible. That's what makes the clothes look white when they come out of the washing machine and you put the washing powder in. So this is quite useful, these kind of transitions between levels in an atom. For one atom, you can go from the second, first level down to the ground and emit light. Now you can imagine, if you had a material where all these atoms were doing the same thing, they're all emitting, but kind of haphazardly, well, you get some kind of light out of it, and it will be reasonably bright. But what happens if you could get them to do it all at the same time, if all the atoms could make a transition down from the first level down to the ground at the same time. Well, we're just going to demonstrate what might happen. Now, I don't go around looking for applause, but I'd just like you to just clap. <laughs> OK. That's great. But now I want you to think of me as the lead atom, and you're all going to follow in time. Do exactly what I do at the same time. And now see, let's see what that sounds like. OK. Great. What you could see is it's much louder when we all do it in unison. So we'd expect far brighter light if all the atoms could be made to make a transition in unison. And that's exactly the principle behind a laser. <coughs> Over here, he has the laser source. It produces a very fine beam, which is passing down the tube. And we've got a balloon at the end. This is a laser-detecting balloon. And we're going to see exactly what happens when we turn up the energy in the laser beam. So he just turned it up. Laser beam's traveling down onto the end of this balloon. You can just about see the laser beam. So the balloon is now absorbing the energy of the laser beam. Oh, <coughs> whoa. Great, thank you very much, Elia. So there's a lot of energy in a laser beam. That was just light. When you shine a torch on a balloon, it doesn't explode. That was a laser beam, and it has a lot of energy in it. By making an atom, or making the electrons in the atom, make transitions between outer levels and inner levels, we get off a definite frequency of light. A definite frequency means a definite number of oscillations per second, an enormous number. And if we were count to count those up, we could use that to define the second and to measure the passing of the second. And that's the principle behind the atomic <coughs> clock. But it's also the principle behind all of this stuff. Because it's our understanding of quantum physics that has enabled us to develop the computers, communications equipment, mobile phones, all the gadgets that we use every day. So I started off asking you, how fast can all this stuff get? Well, to see how fast all this stuff can get, we need to understand just a little bit about how all this works. The computers, while it looks complicated, it's actually quite easy how it works. This is one of the first computers. It's obviously hand-operated. It's an abacus. If I want to add together, here we have ones, tens, hundreds, thousands. If I want to get, add together, for example, six and four, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I add another four, one, two, three, four, that makes ten. That registers a ten. But of course, got to be fairly skillful to do this quickly and it would be nice to have a mechanical device that did it. And it was actually this man, Charles Babbage, who gave us the designs that actually form the basis of our present day computers. Now Charles Babbage was actually motivated for this by a very real need. 
There were a lot of ships being lost at sea. And they were using these navigation tables that were around at the time with calculations made by hand. And a lot of the errors in there, he thought, could be avoided if it would only have a machine that could actually make, take, carry out these calculations and check the tables. So he came up with an invention for such a machine. In fact, he was interested in all machines that kind of add and subtract and keep track of data in a kind of ordered way. He even developed a clocking in clock for a factory, like the one I used at the beginning of the lecture. So his first machines were very much like clocks. They had cogs in them. They had spindles and cogs, and they worked in a very automatic, sequential type of way, very much like a clockwork of a clock. In fact, around the same time, a company that we now know as Making Computers, IBM, used to be called the International Time Recording Company because there's such a similarity in the technology for building clocks and building computers. Of course, nowadays, we don't have any of that stuff, any of that mechanical stuff. It's all replaced by electronics. Computers like this use special kind of mass. So in order to understand how fast they can get, we have to check out what that mass is. And over here, we've got part of the audience who volunteered to be a computer. So could you just hold up your numbers, please? Now what we've got here is at the back, we've got the numbers 1, 2, 4, 8, which are actually powers of 2, because that's how a computer works. It works with zeros and ones. It adds up to 2. So it works with zeros and ones, which are called bits, binary digits. So these are the, what we're going to see. These are the numbers of 1, 2, 4, and 8 that we're actually holding up. They're just the register at the back. These are the guys who are actually going to do the storing of the numbers. And at the moment, we see we have no 1s, no 2s, no 4s, and no 8s. So we're registering the number 0. So I think we'll add 1 to this computer. So just turn your number over. No, no, not you, not, no, that's it. It's a fast computer, but it's not that fast. <laughs> OK, so we're registering 1. Let's add another 1 to it. So that makes 2. So you turn yours over. You turn yours back. So now we're registering the number 2. Add 1 to it. Makes 3. Turn yours over. Now we're on to 4. Now you turn yours round. And you two turn yours back to 0. We're up to 4. 5. Six, seven, you have to work the hardest. Eight, eight is now one on the end, and all of you back to zero. No, you keep yours as a one, and all you zero. That's it, that's eight. Thank you very much, the computer. So that's what computers do. They actually process ones and zeros. But how do they do it? Well, computers are physical things. They're physical machines. They need to be made of something. So we need to understand that. This is what they're made of. This is actually a block of silicon. So you don't need the whole block. All you need to do is just shave off a slice of it. And this is what I've got here, a silicon wafer. In fact, it's already had printed on it a number of circuits, I believe there are around 50 on here. So the silicon wafer is actually cut up, and a bit of it is placed in this, which is a microprocessor. It's a bit difficult to see what's going on. So we're going to bring on a microscope and hand it over to Ilya, who's going to have a look. So Ilya, if you could just line that up for us, please. Now what you can see, oh, we just caught the edge of one of the leads on that silicon chip. So, Ely, if you move across and let's have a look at the transistors. And actually so small, of course, that you can hardly see them. This is really incredible, the way that they get all of this detail onto this silicon chip. Thanks very much, Ilya.